Good evening and welcome to RFL. I'm Richard French. Thank you for joining me this evening. Now on the day that George Floyd is laid to rest in his hometown of Houston, there are renewed calls for racial justice and police reforms. We want to make you, our viewers, probably the biggest part of this program and conversation this evening. So this is how we're going to do it. We're going to have an open and honest dialogue and we open our phone lines to make you, as I said, a major component of that dialogue. The question we're asking, what is the state of race relations in America? The number, well, the toll free number is on your screen right now. 888-766-2428, it spells out to 888-RNN-CHAT. Now you can also email us your thoughts or questions or address rfl at rnntv.com. Floyd's death on Memorial Day, it spurred on two weeks of protests in big cities and small, both here as well as across the globe. And now Democrats in Congress, they're poised to do something to address the concerns of the people who are hitting American streets. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi unveiled the bill just yesterday to address issues with policing. Today, with the Justice and Policing Act, the Congress is standing with those fighting for justice and taking action. We cannot settle for anything less than transformative structural change. The Justice and Policing Act, it requires officer training on racial bias. It also calls for bans on chokeholds and no-knock warrants. It creates a national police misconduct registry and limits qualified immunity, which shields officers from being sued. Today, Senator Chuck Schumer of New York, the minority leader, he's calling for his Republican colleagues to get on board. Americans who took to the streets have demanded change. With this legislation, Democrats are heeding their call. Now, now is the time for Leader McConnell to commit to putting police reform on the floor of the Senate before July 4th to be debated and voted on. Several Republican, Republicans have acknowledged egregious wrong but too few have expressed a need for floor action. Too many remain silent. So that's Washington, and that may be a step forward, but it's not a step far enough for cities like Minneapolis. The city council right there, right now, is working on defunding and dismantling the city's police department in the wake of the killing of George Floyd. Here, the city council president explaining what they intend to do. Yeah, I just stood with a total of nine members of the Minneapolis City Council and we committed to dismantling policing as we know it in the city of Minneapolis and to rebuild with our community a new model of public safety that actually keeps our community safe. And we're hearing loud and clear from thousands of voices in our streets here in the park today, phone calls, emails, that right now our police department is not making our community feel safe. And so our commitment is that every single member of our community have that safety and security that they need. I should tell you, when we say they have the nine votes, well, that would give the city council in Minneapolis a veto-proof majority because the mayor clearly is not on board with how far they want to go. The woman in that uh, sound by Ms. Bender, she went on to explain that the goal, to shift resources away from armed police force into more community-based social service programs. Now, defunding police is, of course, controversial, and that's putting it politely. It is also one of the few, if not only, things that Donald Trump and Joe Biden agree upon. Both the president and the former vice president, they're against defunding. Biden, he wants more reforms. Trump, he wants more law and order. His terms, we are still not sure exactly what that means. Now, supporters of defunding say that reducing policing, it'll help communities of color will enable cities to provide better social services and will pump more money into crime prevention. Opponents say it will drive up crime rates, increase response times for 911 calls, and also hamper investigations. Defunding and disbanding, it is controversial, but I should note that it's actually been done before and not that long ago. In 2012, in Camden, New Jersey, it was a city with one of the highest crime rates of any American metropolis, and it decided to disband the police force. There was a lot of corruption allegations at the time, and instead rebuild from scratch using the county force and shift some funding. Here now, the former police commissioner. There was a reinvestment into the school systems, and uh, by employing a policing practice wherein we stopped focusing on the number of tickets we wrote, 
or the amount of arrest we made. What we were more interested in was making people feel safer, making people trust us, or getting people to trust us. Now, since Camden made all those changes, crime rates, they are down, and so are complaints against police. Um, I should tell you, just for transparency, I think that is a bridge too far, especially now. But I want to bring you some numbers that show where the American public stands when it comes to race and policing. And again, I'm going to be getting your reaction here. So match your views here with uh, national public polls. Three quarters of the American public say that racism is, in fact, a big problem in America. Nearly six in 10 say police more likely to mistreat African-Americans rather than whites. Now, when you break down the numbers by race, 90% of blacks say racism is a huge problem in the U.S. 71% of whites agree with the sentiment. 53% say race relations have become worse since Trump became president. And you want to break down that by race, three quarters of all blacks polled say things have worsened under Trump and 45% of whites agree with that. I want to bring in our guest right now. And again, we will soon get your reaction to this. Journalist and author Jesse Holland joins us now. Jesse, thanks so much. And there's so many different ways I want to start with this. But in a few minutes, I'm going to be getting the calls from our audience. And I'm trying to get where they're coming from, regardless of where they're calling me from or their background, as to where they see the state of race relations in America. But if you look at it as an opportunity right now, what is the question we really ought to be asking uh, our lawmakers to do? Because I could come at this from two different ways. I look at gun control after Sandy Hook, and some say they tried too macro an approach, and at the end of the day, they really got nothing from the federal level, and it was all really kicked down to the states. Um, but people say if you narrow cast this and make this purely a policing issue, you're missing an opportunity that after generation after generation, we really haven't broken through. What do you think practically and principally the approach ought to be right now in Washington? Well, the question that we need to answer is, do we want justice or do we want peace? Because those can be two different things. Keep in mind that we've been talking about this issue and police reform for generations in America, going all the way back to the riots that happened in Red Summer of 1919, going back to the riots that happened in Watts, going back to the riots that happened in all of the different states across America. We've been talking about taking care of police violence for generations. And the question seems to be simply, when are we going to act as a country? When are we going to act to ensure that everyone is treated by the police equally. Until we do, we're going to continue to see some of the same things that we've seen go on in the last two weeks. Obviously, Jesse, I don't come from this with the same background remotely you do, but I have a good sense of what's going to happen, at least at certain uh, state capitals. I think it's practical that in the bluer states, you're going to have banning on things like chokeholds and some, you know, you're not going to see legalized anymore or even thought that a knee on the neck is going to be okay. I think you'll also have qualified immunity radically changed. I think also there'll be more transparency of political uh, police, dis, you know, disciplinary reports here and even criminalized if somebody's using 911 uh, to make some race-based thing like we saw out of Central Park. But my question is, at the end of the day, that's what comes out of this are you going to be disappointed? Can you put tangible where we will be in a much better place as a country so that next summer, if you and I have this conversation, we are in a much different place than just semantics? Well, let's, I want to be very clear about something. I have relatives who are police officers. I grew up in a town called Holly Springs, Mississippi, where that elected its first black sheriff when I was a child. So, we're now, no one's arguing that police shouldn't exist. No one's arguing that police aren't needed. What people seem to be arguing is that there needs to be a change in how policing happens. Here's the thing. We've had this conversation before. We've had this conversation. Ida B. Wells wrote books about this in the past. We've had this conversation around Michael Brown. We've had this conversation around Eric Garner. We've had this conversation around Freddie Gray. Would I be shocked 
if we're having this conversation again next summer? No, I wouldn't be shocked. I am hopeful, however, that eventually, perhaps, that this change will happen. We're seeing things that we haven't seen in generations. The volume of people out on the streets asking for equality and justice seems to be larger than it has been in a very long time. Maybe this time people are paying attention. But I will tell you what I am seeing more and more from not only people out on the streets, but from politicians and voters as well. People are beginning to ignore what's coming out of Washington, D.C., and focusing on what's happening in their own towns. These police forces are not run by the federal government. These police forces are run by mayors, they're run by states, they're run by counties. And people are beginning to hold their local officials responsible, who are the people who are actually in charge of these forces. If that actually ha takes hold, if people start holding their mayors, their county councils, their city councilmen, councilmen and councilwomen responsible, that's when you start seeing change, when people start ignoring what's going on in Washington and paying attention to the politics that are happening in their own neighborhoods. Hey, this morning, uh, I went to a, a rally because my daughter and her friend set it up and 400 people went there. And, you know, I, I, in a million years, I would never have done that when I was her age. And they looked at my generation as to where the hell have you been? So something different is going on. I don't know, though. Um, at least I've learned before that where well, there's hope, you, you got to do the follow up. And to that end, I saw some numbers, Jesse, that have nothing to do with policing, but speak to opportunity. Um, and again, I think I got a pretty good handle on this. I had no idea how wrong I was. You figure since 68 to now, we've had major gains in this country. But I'd argue that it's bad, if not worse than it was economically. I'm just going to give a couple. There's like 50 of these. The Washington Post did this story last week. The combined net worth of nearly 12 black households in this country is what you'd have to do to get the net worth of a typical single white household. And then... A typical black household headed by someone with an advanced degree has less wealth than a white house with only a high school diploma. So we can pat ourselves in the back all we want about how great and all the strides we've made, but if there is an opportunity, then all the great policing in the world, we're going to still have the same problem, won't we? Well, here's the thing. Protests don't begin because of one incident. Protests begin because there have been a million incidents in advance, and you then have an inciting incident. George Floyd's death didn't start these protests. George Floyd's death was the inciting incident. Everything you just said, going back to redlining, going back to people being pulled over unjustly by police, people being um, forced to take underpaying jobs, people being forced to be being ignored in this society, the societal contract that has been broken. People have been going through a lot over the last decade. And all of these are lining up to what you see today. If I could, Jesse, let me um, ask this final question. And again, we're going to get our audience uh, to join us. And if I have the ages wrong, I apologize. But I believe you have a, a son about 11 years old and a daughter around 13. Correct. Put yourself back in Mississippi as a young boy. Are you more optimistic about, given where we are in 2020, your son's future that lies ahead of him than you were when you were a kid, the same or worse? I will tell you that I am more optimistic for my son and my daughter than... I would have been five years, 10 years ago. My son and daughter have friends from every race, every gender, every nationality, and every economic class. I see my children willing to play with anyone, willing to talk to anyone. And that wasn't an opportunity that I grew up with in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. I see my children hopeful 
about the future, but they're also realistic. My 11-year-old son came to his parents and asked us if the police were going to kill him. And I had to have that frank conversation with him of the experiences I had growing up and the conversation that my father had with him, that ha had with me when I was growing up. I think that this generation right now, the children who are coming up now, are seeing the things that are going on and will not tolerate it as they get older because they see it. And I, hopefully they'll be the ones to finally change it. Jesse, I appreciate the time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. So this is what um, we decided to do. Uh, we could have had lawmakers on. I could have talked about all the debates about public policy. And tomorrow we'll be joined uh, by both um, an African-American mayor uh, whose city is wrestling uh, with where to go with policing as well as a member of Congress to talk about what's going on on Capitol. But tonight what I wanted to do was to give you a chance at home and everybody's opinion on this, you know, as qualified as anybody else's, okay? I don't care. Black, white, old, young. If you're calling me from a big city or from a suburb or even a rural area, I want to give you a chance to weigh in. Where are we right now? with race in America. What is the state of it? You can look at this half full and say, we are seeing protests with a rainbow like we haven't seen before in this country. And there's a real chance for change. Others may turn around and say, I've seen this story before. We have major problems as now evidenced by what we've captured on video with Mr. Floyd and other tragic incidents. I wanna hear from you, not just what the problems are, but where we go to solve them. All right, your reaction, everyone, straight ahead, right after this.